yeah, so thanks everyone for coming along to, or tuning in virtually to see my talk. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about some craters in the NT uh, and how that's tied in with my PhD uh, research and why it's important. So the title is Craters in the NT, a shocking tale of space rocks colliding with the top end. Is it going? Okay, so yeah, a little bit about me. So I grew up in Darwin, uh, so I do call Darwin home. Um, and uh, I'm currently finishing up my PhD on high pressure deformation of minerals from asteroid impacts. So it's to de develop a better understanding of the timing and spatial distribution of meteorite impacts on Earth. And during this time, I've been able to do some cool stuff like go to Goss's Bluff in the Northern Territory. Uh, and I had an internship at NASA, so I got to actually go into the lunar vault and see um, some of the um, lunar and Martian meteorites, which is very cool. And rocks from the moon. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, during my PhD, the main focus was studying uh, deformed minerals and rocks. So um, I had a couple of sample locations from the Woodley impact crater, trying to decipher the difference between pre and post impact deformation, what deformation was caused by re regional um, shearing and faulting and uh, what was caused by impact processes. Um, and then uh, I worked on some of the Chicxulub drill core, which is the dinosaur killing impact, uh, some Martian meteorites and Archean metasediments. Uh, but I'm currently working as an exploration geologist while I finish up on my PhD. So just over here is a picture of uh, thousands of zircons uh, from just one of the many samples I looked at in my PhD looking for deformation. So to start off, before we get into it, uh, what is an impact crater? So an impact crater is pretty much a hole in the ground which is formed from a large asteroid hitting the Earth. Um, a prime example is a dinosaur killing asteroid impact event, uh, which was 7 billion times as powerful as a Hiroshima bomb. So we're talking about a lot of energy, um, a lot of force um, during these impact events. Uh, but we're lucky because we have Mars and Jupiter, um, their orbits which keep the asteroids within the asteroid belt to a certain degree. So uh, we're not gonna get dinosaur killing impacts every day of the week. So here's a little GIF showing when the initial asteroid hits, you get a shock wave that sends through the target rock um, and you get impact melt and then you get a rebound of the crust um, as excavation starts to occur um, and you start to form your impact structure as it cools and then modifies um, and then you get your um, final structure form. So it's a pretty um, dynamic process with lots of things occurring all at the same time. So up the top of this section here, um, can you see my mouse at all? Uh, let me see, remote control, no. Uh, so the top picture, you've got the projectile hitting, which is the contact and compression stage. And then you have, once a shockwave uh, runs through the target rock, you then get um, the onset of the um, excavation stage where you're getting uplift. Um, and then during uh, the excavation stage, based on the size of the asteroid that has hit the earth or the target rock. You can get either a simple crater or a complex crater. Uh, simple craters are generally under 10 kilometers, mainly under about four kilometers in diameter. Uh, and then complex craters are much larger. Uh, simple craters, which are on the left, are bowl shaped features. Whereas complex craters have a central uplift and that's on the right hand side. Uh, so you have a central region that has been uplifted from kilometers, sometimes kilometers, um, hundreds hundreds of meters uh, below the surface. So why study impact craters? Well, it's important because they help us understand the early earth and the early evolution of life. Um, they help us to understand mass extinction events um, and future risks. So understanding what a certain size asteroid hitting the earth, what that means and what we need to understand about that. Uh, but lots of asteroids have also associated with world-class ore deposits. So, uh, there are two main structures that have, uh, well, there are multiple structures, but the two main ones that I'll talk about just briefly are the Sudbury and Fredefort dome impact structures. So Sudbury is in Canada and uh, uh, there's world-class nickel and co copper sulfide um, and platinum group uh, uh, element uh, deposits that are associated with the cooling of the impact melt. So when you have, um, the asteroid hitting the target rock, you're obviously going to get a layer of melt on top. And based on the, the cooling of that melt, um, these deposits formed. 
and then at the free to fort dome impact structure the um what you needed to form the gold deposits was there but the impact formed a large hydrothermal um event which was able to then um uh, um condense the uh the gold within the the ring of the crater so on the right hand side you can see here um, this is three to four and you've got the gold fields that are all associated with um, uh, the crater which is really really cool so there's large potential across australia for world-class ore deposits to be associated with um, uh, impact craters but also within the nt because the nt has a lot of impact craters um, and a lot of world-class ore deposits so how do you confirm an impact crater? Uh, there's multiple ways uh, with the macroscopic, um, what you can see in your hand or what you can see out in the field being shatter cones, which is this image on the right. Uh, so they're conical features um, which radiate from a point um, and they can be up to 360 degrees. So they're really cool features. Uh, and they can be multiple meters in, in size down to uh, centimeters to millimeters in size. And you can get meteoritic fragments in the form of meteorites or within anom anomalies within um, magmas and melts, or you can get um, the microscale, which is uh, shock deformation features in quartz, such as cleavage and planar deformation features, or within accessory phases such as zircons and a team of monazite, you can get high pressure phases, deformation twinning. So some really cool microstructures uh, that form within these minerals. Uh, and this image on the left is a uh, quartz grain with planar deformation features. And what's cool about the planar deformation features is different orientations of these features that form within quartz can indicate different pressures. And that's based on, off of uh, multiple laboratory studies that have been able to calibrate the pressures required to form these PDFs. So when you look at the moon and you compare it to Earth, the Earth has a lot less craters than the moon. And that's obviously because we have flowing water, we have um, erosion, uh, we have um, uh, a very dynamic planet, we have subducting plates, uh, whereas the moon is quite stagnant. So the moon contains a lot of craters that have been preserved over billions of years, which is really, really interesting. So when we look at the Earth, we've only got about 200 craters that are preserved. Um, and as you can see, lots of the craters are preserved in areas with higher density of populations or with older exposed rock and not in the rainforests or in the oceans. Within Australia, we have multiple impact structures. Um, this is a new study by Quintero et al, which is a really cool study that goes into looking at the confirmed structures and possible and contested structures, as well as going into depth about uh, um, advances within understanding of these structures. So um, I suggest you go read that paper if you're interested in this kind of stuff, because it's a, a really good um, review. Um, and then within Northern Territory itself, there is 11 confirmed impact structures, which um, many of them uh, are very cool and uh, form, are formed in very interesting target rocks. Um, but there's heaps of um, possible or potential impact craters. So there's still a lot of work to be done with um, NT structures. Lots of the confirmed structures have had shocked minerals such as shock quartz or uh, zircon found within these structures, as well as uh, well-preserved shatter cones. Um, but many of these ages are, of these structures are poorly constrained or there's not enough work done on these structures because it's a lot harder when you've got an impact structure that's been eroded to a certain degree because you don't have that newly recrystallized impact melt on top. So you've got to start to look for breaches and other things to find uh, newly recrystallized um, uranium lead geochronometers. So first one I'll talk about today is Goss's Bluff. So I was lucky enough to be able to go out to this structure um, a few years back. Um, and it's one of the most beautiful structures I've been to. So it's about 150 kilometers west of Alice Springs. And it's situated on an east-west trending syncline um, within the West McDonald Ranges. So really interesting target rocks um, with already pre-existing deformation. And the main target rocks are Paleozoic sedimentary rocks. Um, there's lots of sandstones and siltstones. Um, so we can form some really interesting uh, shatter cones within these um, uh, rock types because the, the finer the grain size, the better the looking shatter cone. When you've got much coarser minerals, it's a lot harder to align them to form the uh, shatter cone structures. Now, the structure's heavily eroded. So what you see in the center here is actually just the central uplift. Um, 
it's actually a much larger structure. Uh, so this is a picture um, that Aaron Cavosi, my PhD supervisor, took of um, the central uplift of the structure. Uh, so it's a really beautiful place to visit. Uh, here's a satellite image of the structure. Um, when you fly over it with a plane, it's actually really cool to see because you can spot it out. Um, and this is a geological map. So within this um, central uplift region, it's mainly sandstones. Uh, with shatter cones and some impact melts. Um, within the centre, you've got uh, a lot more silt LB, stones. Let's have a look at this. Um, and then on the outskirts of it, you've got actually about uh, three kilometres, I think it is, to the south. Um, you've got Mount Pyroclast, which has impact melts, as well as um, swayvites um, and some really complicated rocks. So the structure is estimated to have been around 24 kilometres in diameter before it was eroded. Um, and it's estimated to have occurred around 142 million years ago. Um, there's been some work on trying to constrain that age a bit, but this is um, pretty sure the minimum age it could be. Abundant shatter cones have been identified across the structure. Um, and really well-developed shatter cones from centimetres up to metre scale. It was quite mind-blowing how large some of the shatter cones were at the structure. Uh, and shock zircon, um, shocked quartz and diaplectic glass have been identified at the structure. So on the right here is uh, some shock quartz with planar deformation features. Uh, and then below it is a picture um, we took while we were out in the field. Uh, and it was really interesting because there was lots of joint sets across the structure and along those joints were where the shatter cone surfaces were. So it's almost like the shock wave was able to propagate through these different um, uh, joints which had formed before the shatter cones then formed. Oh, well, that's um, potentially what occurred, but based on the observations, that's um, what it's looking like. But it was really cool all across the structure were these joints and everywhere you could just see shatter cone surfaces everywhere. Now, the structure is suggested to be um, asymmetric um, uh, and potentially based. This is due to an oblique impact. So you've had a highly eroded structure that um, the asteroids uh, impacted at an oblique angle, and therefore you've got an asymmetric structure. Here are some of the, the rocks we saw when we were out there. So up on the left here, we've got class of siltstone and sandstone within a... Um, uh, uh, breccia. Um, there were some bits of melt in here, but not much at all uh, from memory. <laughs> but then this one over here was actually really interesting because we were thinking that these little um, flowy textures, that it would be all really fresh impact melt. But when you get in, into looking at it at the fin section, um, there's actually uh, a lot of clasps and, and uh, recipient minerals in there. So it wasn't clean enough to be able to get like really good argon dating on it. Um, and here's some example of some of the PDFs from some of the um, joints throughout the, the central uplift of the structure. We also saw um, some melt dikes through the structure. So uh, these are examples of how wide some of them can get. Um, but this also wasn't just purely impact melt. It had a lot of class and a lot of um, uh, um, minerals throughout it that were um, inherited. Uh, but what's really cool is also that Gosses Bluff has um, cultural significance to the Aboriginal people. Um, so it uh, based on um, uh, the Aboriginal people um, uh, and uh, their story behind Gosses Bluff, it was formed in um, creation time when a group of women danced around the sky as the Milky Way. And during this dance, a mother put her baby aside resting in its wooden baby carrier. This carrier then toppled over the edge of the dancing area and crashed to earth where it transformed into the cir circular rock walls of um, um, what we call uh, Gosses, Gosses Bluff within the impact community. So it's really cool that it, uh, there's a connection between um, indigenous people and uh, this special site and also that we're able to study it and understand more about it in terms of um, the geology behind it. Um, and yes, yeah, so I thought that was really cool. So next I'll talk about is Amelia Creek. This is a structure I haven't been to, but it's one on my bucket list that I really want to be able to go see. So it's uh, located um, uh, just south of Tennant Creek. Uh, it's about 20 kilometers in diameter and it's deeply eroded. Um, so just down here. Uh, and it's suggested to have occurred um, about 640 to 600 million years ago. 
uh, and this young courage is determined from um, overlying uh, rocks. So no um, uranium lead uh, constraints on this, just based on um, uh, the geology within the area. So this is a really cool geological map. And what's really cool is a center part here within the structure is pervasive shadow, cone, uh, shadow cones. Um, and it's one of the largest occurrences within Australia of shadow cones. Um, uh, Goss's Bluff is another good example of shadow cones. Uh, but then you've also got bits of breccia throughout the structure. Um, and it's also got lots of rocks that contain um, uh, um, minerals that we could use to try and date this structure um, to better constrain it, which would be really important. So previous studies on it have identified shadow cones and shock quartz. Here's an example of these are planar fractures with feather features that occur off. And what's really cool about feather features is that they can give you a generalized direction of which way the shock wave propagated through the rock. So studies have shown um, by uh, studies by Paul Chow and Kenkman have determined that these feather features line up with the, the um, uh, sigma one within the rock, so the angle, uh, the direction that the shock wave propagated through. So you know that if you looked at another quartz grain um, up to the left or down to the right, that you'd see feather features in pretty much the exact um, same orientation within the rock. So it's a really cool way of um, trying to understand more about um, uh, stress directions within different crystals and within different rocks. Um, yeah, so uh, the shadow cones over, uh, overprint the, and post-date the Paleoproterozoic Regional Deformation, which is really cool. Um, uh, so that means that the, re, uh, the impact structure has not been refolded after the impact event. So it's another great example to go and study how previously deformed rocks, how they then deform with higher pressures. And it'd also be cool to, to look more into, do we reactivate certain faults or folds or um, shear zones? Um, so that would be something that would be really interesting at the structure. And similarly to Goss's Bluff, there's an asymmetry to the overall structure, which may also indicate a, a highly oblique impact event. Now, strange ways, strain ways, sorry. <laughs> so that's about 24 to 40 kilometers in diameter, and it's heavily eroded. Uh, and it's located just down here, just east, uh, southeast of um, Catherine. Now the target rocks are mesoproterozoic sedimentary rocks. So you've got quartzite, shale, siltstones, and that's overlying a granitic basement. Now what's cool about that is that um, you're gonna have a lot of uranium lead uh, minerals, uh, geochronometer minerals that you could use to try and date the structure. Um, now evidence of impact include shadow cones, PDS in quartz, impact melt and suavite breaches and a possible geochemical anomaly. So there was presence of the, the impact or within the, the impact melt. And the structure is very evident in um, geophysical imagery. Uh, so it is actually a really interesting structure. And as you can see that part of the structure, you can't see this rim, whereas this side you can. Uh, so based on this sort of preferential eroding. Now the structure has been suggested uh, to be about 646 million years in age. Um, so they're all quite similar um, in ages, uh, Amelia Creek and Shangways. So uh, this is also a very interesting structure. Um, some of the um, mapping that was done shows quite a large amount of impact melt. So these, these black blobs are all impact melts, um, as well as uh, granitoids and quartzite breaches, um, and lots of sandstone within the area. So lots of work could be done on, on the quartz, um, in terms of trying to find out where the actual angle of the impact was in terms of sigma one, uh, but also understanding more about how different minerals deform um, when you have different lithologies um, would be really interesting to do at this uh, impact structure. But some really good work on mapping um, and dating and um, understanding more about the minerals has been done on the structure, which is really cool. So just uh, kind of, bringing that all together with what I do, uh, what I've been doing in my PhD. So this is a, a EBSD map, so a, a map of um, zircon grains and their orientation. So the different colors indicate orientations of the crystals, their C-axis and their different axes. 
and discoloration within individual minerals indicates deformation within those crystals. So shock zircon is something that has been a large part of my PhD um, and zircon um, with uh, shocked microstructures have been proven to uh, survive through multiple geological processes, so through magmatism, sedimentary work in metamorphism. This zircon up here um, is an example of a shock zircon from uh, the Frida Ford impact structure. And some of the studies um, uh, by Montalvo and Ericsson et al. have shown that these shocked minerals can survive thousands of kilometers um, in transportation and still retain these, these deformation microstructures. Um, and magmatism, so uh, this little crystal down here to the left with the core and then the newly crystallized rim, that survived magmatism within the three to four um, impact structure. So you have a shock twinned core with a newly recrystallized rim, which is super interesting to show that we can still retain this microstructure. And then the right hand side, that is a shock zircon that has uh, survived metamorphism. So we know these, these zircons can survive multiple reworking events. So when we tie that into early earth, uh, Australia has a lot of old rocks, old metasedimentary rocks. Um, and models have predicted that Hadean and Archean was heavily bombarded by meteorite impacts. So this is an example by Marchi et al, which shows multiple impact events, these little circles on, on Earth. And Earth was hit by 20 times more impacts than the moon. So when I showed you that image at the beginning, the moon was completely covered by impacts. Earth should have looked like that. But like I mentioned before, we have flowing water, we have um, tectonic processes. So lots of that evidence has removed, been removed over billions of years. Now we know the moon and uh, Mars both have ancient shock zircon grains. And we have ancient shock grains, 4 billion, 3 billion year old zircons in metasedimentary rocks on Earth. So likely we should be seeing uh, shock zircons within there. So shock zircons, just like in the impact craters that I showed in um, uh, from the Northern Territory, if they were then eroded over millions or billions of years and then were then deposited in a metasedimentary rock, we would see evidence of that. Um, because those microstructures would not be removed. So during my PhD, I've used EBSD, uh, BSE, so orientation mapping of these crystals, backscatter electron imaging of these crystals uh, from Archean metasediments across the Yilgarn to try and detect evidence of early Earth impacts. Uh, I've um, been able to detect multiple grains of interest that have deformation, such as this grain up here, where we have discoloration. So we are seeing evidence of Archean and Hadean deformation processes, which is really, really cool. So by dating bunches of these grains that all have similar microstructures, we can likely predict or hypothesize that those grains suggested similar tectonic events or deformation events. So another way my PhD ties into this is impact versus tectonic deformation, um, the prime example at the Woodley impact structure. So uh, Highly shocked gran granitic orthronices, paranices, um, amphibolite is um, observed throughout uh, the core. And so here's some examples up here of some of the deformed rocks. And within those rocks, there's about 80 meters of uh, a myelinic section, so a highly strained section. And all these fabrics show consistent orientation. Um, they're all horizontal. Uh, um, and the ductile brittle faults are perpendicular to these fabrics. Um, so it's really interesting to see, uh, obviously the orientation, you, um, the fabrics couldn't have formed like that, they'd have to be overturned. Um, so it's likely that this occurred um, pre-impact and then was reworked or deformed after that and then impacted into. And based on our um, observations, uh, within the quartz, within the, um, the geology of the Woodley, we found that the fabrics um, within the rocks contain shock to form quartz. So quartz grains with planar deformation features. But what's significant is that post shockwave propagation, excavation and modification will anneal PDFs. So if these PDFs formed in the rocks and then the fabrics formed after, those fabrics would have been, would have removed the PDFs. So the fabrics had to have formed pre-impact event. 
So what's really cool is that we're getting an asteroid impact that's exhuming uh, mid-crustal rocks multiple kilometres uh, within the central uplift of an impact structure, and we're still retaining these deformation um, microstructures and crystal preferred orientations and shape preferred orientations and quartz. These fabrics formed multiple kilometres below the surface, but we're able to have uh, um, a little sneak peek at what is below um, uh, uh, the um, current geology of the area. What's also cool is that there have been studies based on observation uh, within um, uh, naturally deformed rocks from impact craters, as well as um, experimentally deformed rocks. So it's shown that initial shockwave um, has been has resulted in the formation of redite throughout the core, as well as uh, PDS in quartz. And then this likely occurred during acoustic fluid fluidization of the target rock. So the target rock's deforming, it's weakening, but then it's regaining strength once that initial shock wave has gone through the rock. Now the onset of the rare rarefaction wave, um, which is once you've got a shock wave and then you've got your rarefaction wave that then catches up to that shock wave through target rocks, that's likely forming 112 twins in zircon. So this is a zircon. This is redite, a high pressure polymorph within zircon, and these are twins. And the redite is offset along the twins. So we're able to untie uh, these uh, impact induced deformation features. You can't get twins like this and redite within zircon unless it's experienced 20 GPA or higher. So this is not a um, uh, um, deformation. Uh, this is not deformation that occurs in normally deformed terrestrial rocks. It has to be an asteroid impact. Now the collapse of the transient cavity um, has been suggested to cause localized shearing and faulting and cataclastic flow. So these offsets, these faults and shear zones that we observe within the um, uh, woodly core at more um, macroscopic scale rather than within the regional scale is likely um, due to uh, the impact event and offsetting along these features. So uh, impacts can help us understand the bigger picture. We have multiple craters and structures in NT, and there's still so much to study. So there's a lot of um, structures that we haven't even confirmed yet. Um, majority of the structures contain uranium lead geochronometers. So by studying these rocks, we can help to constrain ages of these impact events, uh, which will then in turn help us understand more about the evolution of the Earth and the bombardment history of the Earth. There are pre-Cambrian metasedimentary rocks in NT in WA across Australia. So can we look in these um, rocks for detrital minerals such as zircon to find evidence of these old impacts that have since eroded, such as Gosses Bluff? Imagine if that was completely eroded uh, and we had rock, sedimentary rocks down the road. If we looked into the zircons, we should be able to find uh, shock zircons from that structure. Now, resource potential of craters. Can we find another three to four to Sudbury within Australia? Uh, by the timing of these events, was it likely that uh, we created um, a seal for, um, or a cap for um, hydrocarbons? Or um, did we uh, create a hydrothermal system from an impact event to, to form um, a world-class gold deposit in Australia? Another cool thing is that impacts can remove liquid water from a planet or blow off atmospheres. So we know that impacts are so large that they can cause extinction level events. So by understanding more about impacts and um, how they've occurred on Earth and other planets, we can understand a little bit more about how life may have been transported or water or even the timing of life. Um, so there is super important process. And by understanding the craters we have in our backyard, we can then understand more about our solar system and extrapolate to other planets such as Mars and um, Jupiter and, and uh, Saturn and Venus. So yeah, they're very, very important things. So with that, um, I'd like to say thank you. Um, I know it wasn't fully just uh, NT craters, kind of went a little bit to the left about everything, but um, I hope you all enjoyed it. <laughs>